what is reproducibility? Okay, so right now we're just talking about like getting an analysis written in R. Um, but once you have that analysis written, you want to be able to rerun it reliably um, to, so you can trust your results. So reproducibility in its essence in a practical sense just means that a different person, not you, reperforms the analysis with the same code, the same data, and they get the same result. So let's talk about what this means. So like maybe this person, this Ruby, the researcher, um, is like you. And after this class, um, you've written, or through this class, you've written a great analysis and you have some really cool pattern that you want to share. Uh, and so now, how do you know that this result is, is trustworthy? Well, first of all, you need to make sure that you can get this result more than once. Um, it, getting your code to work once is a start, but you need to repeat it and refresh and delete and keep running it and see, do I still get the same thing? Because if you don't, Again, we'll talk about how, how we try to make sure that that, it, that is reliable. Okay, then the next step is you trust your that in your hands, you can get the same result. Um, now, how do you know if someone else can get your same result if you hand them the code and the data? All right, so here we have Avi, the associate. How do we know that the results that Ruby got that can also be gotten um, by someone else? Now, beyond rep, uh, reproducibility, is called rep replicability. Um, and that's just the idea of now the same concept that our result has shown, can we get it again uh, if we use different data? So if we use different data, but we're using the same kind of analysis, do we still get that same idea? So we can think of this then as like a, a pyramid, all right? We're starting on the bottom of this pyramid. This is the foundation of our analysis is that we ourselves can repeat our same thing and we get the same results. The next step of that is that our collaborators or our person down the hall, they can rerun our analysis and they get the same result. And then after that, we're able to then say, okay, now can we generalize this to other data sets, okay? So, you can't skip to reproducibility without first being able to be repeatable. So let's talk about this in terms of like stories, right? So Ruby finds something super interesting and, and her associate here is very interested and in, it's because it's relevant um, to his work. So she says, here, here's my code. It works really well on my computer. Let me email it to you. Um, and he's super excited to run it. Uh, and then like nothing is working and everything's breaking and it's very confusing because Ruby was so sure that everything was running fine. Um, and then they got emails going back and forth and it's like, Ruby's like, it works fine for me. I don't understand why it's not working for you. Um, and even if he does get it working, it could be that he gets a slightly different result. And so now like between them, they don't know like which result do we trust? Like maybe that difference of 0 0.002 isn't a big deal, but like it is kind of though, because how do you know then? Like which, which result is, is really um, trustworthy and why, why did it turn out different for, for one person than another? Um, so that's the essence of reproducibility, but this is just to say that it's not easy <laughs> to make things reproducible, um, but it's certainly worth your payoff, right? It, it's a tortoise's game. It, it's incremental and it's a slow process, but I'm here to motivate you to say that it does have super high payoffs. So they reproducible analyses, they save everyone time and effort. So they save yourself effort. So like, let's say Ruby runs her code right now. And then later, maybe this is only a week later, maybe it's months later, maybe it's a year later. Um, she tries to rerun her code. Uh, there's a good chance <laughs> things on her computer have changed. Maybe the data had it go went through different versions. Uh, it might not run again, or if it runs again, it may not get the same result. And another reason that reproducibility uh, is efficient for everyone is let's say Ruby is super excited about this and she sends it to all of her collaborators, but all of her collaborators are getting the same error, right? Now, now the error that was only in Ruby's computer, now it's everybody else is also encountering the same thing. And they also each individually might be trying to fix that same error. But if Ruby was able to make her code just a little more reproducible, it doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect. Maybe somebody still encounters an error, 
but it hopefully saves everybody time in that they can reliably rerun that code. Okay, so then this just goes back to the idea that first we need our results to be re repeatable, right? Like if you can't get your same answer twice, you shouldn't expect that when you send off your code, somebody else can get your same answer, right? Like it starts with you being able to write uh, an analysis and, and reliably get the same thing. So here, just put out in like these very vague, dumb steps, like first, just don't even worry about reproducibility at first necessarily. Um, it'll come with time, but like write your code so it works once. That's what, that's all you need to focus on first. Then once you've gotten to work once, get it? So when you delete all your results and you rerun it again, it works again and again and again until you feel very confident that like I can rerun this um, and it's, it's still gonna show me the same result. And then step three is where we get to reproducibility. Now get your code to work for somebody else. You have a collaborator, you have um, a colleague who's working on something similar, who should be interested in it. See if they can run the code in their hands and still get the same result. So this is just to say like, don't put pressure on yourself to like make your reproducible analysis like perfect uh, on the first try, right? Like if you were writing a grant or, or a paper, like you wouldn't just write a draft and then be mad at yourself because, oh, it wasn't perfect the first time. You incrementally edit it, you edit it, you send it to a collaborator who edits it some more. Um, and this is just to say it's on a continuum, right? Like you at some point can run that code once, um, and then maybe it's a little more reproducible the more times you run it because you sort out some more bugs. And hopefully you just keep inching this um, analysis towards the right of this continuum where eventually it can hopefully be run in most contexts and you can feel confident that you're still gonna get the same result. Um, so this course, we're gonna try to get you to uh, understand the concept that you are gonna write a, a code a piece of code once, but like, don't let it end there. Um, over time, just like return to it, try to make it a little more polished um, each time. So we already talked about our markdown notebooks. They're very handy for making reproducible analyses. Um, but let's talk about why. Why are they handy for reproducibility? So here's Ruby again, and she's saying how working from a notebook, which is what our markdowns um, are, it can help you to interactively develop your data analysis and write down your thoughts in one place. So it's kind of like giving a storybook, right? Like the scientific thought process is, is kind of like a journal sometimes. Like you say, you go in with a hypothesis um, and you say, I, I think this is gonna happen with my data. Um, now let, let me document how I got there. Um, so our markdowns are very conducive to interactive development. So that's, that's reason one why our markdowns are great for, for reproducibility. Reason two is you can easily create shareable output for your collaborators. So when you send your results to your collaborators, rather than just sending them like a results table or like the, the punchline, maybe sometimes you just send them a punchline, but if you want them to really understand what your results mean, you can send them uh, the HTML file that we created um, in the exercise. You can send them something like that where then they can see oh, that's the code that um, they use to get this result. And that just puts even more trust on those results. Or if there's something that looks peculiar, they can spot it more easily because they know how you got to that conclusion. So it makes your output, your results more shareable more easily. Um, and then also like data, I'm sure you have data trickling in all the time. So you have to update your analyses. So if you have a reproducible notebook, What's handy is then Ruby here can just, oh, she got five more samples because of this notebook setup. Um, she can call one command and rerun the whole thing. And now the whole analysis is updated with those extra samples. So it's handy for creating your updatable reports. Okay, so that's how our markdowns are um, conducive to reproducibility. Uh, the concept behind some of this is just like, why are we showing you to use this stuff, and, and this is kind of why. Another thing that affects reproducibility is uh, package versions. So let's say, going back to our, our characters here, um, they both have these different um, computing environments, right? Like you all installed RStudio in R, um, and maybe you have 
mostly the same R version, but like as you're starting to install more packages, you might have different package versions um, and that ultimately do, we do know that those affect how your results come out. So what we're gonna show uh, a little bit is um, how can you control for that a little bit? And, and the, the simplest way you can do that is by using um, session info uh, printout. So it's just a function that you would put in your R markdown. We can show you that later. Um, but it prints out a list of like what you were using to do your analysis. And so this is a two examples of like, maybe this is what Ruby and, and Avi's um, session info looked like, right? Like maybe they had different R versions um, they had different operating systems, but all session info is doing is recording that information. So now you know when that notebook was last run, when the R markdown was last run, what was it being run with? So then if you do get something like a different discrepancy like this, where you get different results, it just gives you the ability to maybe trace back what was the, the reason that that was different. Okay. Another big concept that I'm just going to cover in just like the concept level, and then maybe as you go along, you can start to incorporate this more, is what dry code is. Okay, so dry code doesn't really have anything to do with water. It's an acronym where it's don't repeat yourself, okay? So the idea is, is when you write something the first time, uh, again, like when you write a paper or a manuscript, um, you, it may not be the most fluent language, right? Like I, this is me trying to be clever where I wrote this sentence, right? Dry code is easier on readers because they don't have to review the same thing twice, but also because they don't have to review the same thing twice, right? That's redundant. I didn't need to say to review the same thing twice. Um, and so the code works the same way. You might write it once. And then when you come back through it, you're like, oh, I could have done that more efficiently. I needed to only use, I could have done two steps to get there instead of 10 steps to get there. Um, and that is not only more readable for yourself. So then future you can come back and be like, oh, I totally understand what's happening more than I did before. Um, but it's also helpful for people who are reading your code. So say you have collaborators or colleagues who are interested, um, that helps them follow along better. So step one is always just get your code working. Don't stress out about, um, making your code perfect the first time. Um, just like how you can delete a sentence in a manuscript, that first intro sentence, you write it and delete it, write it, delete it. Don't, don't stress out, just try to get it working. And then after you come back iteratively, you can say, how do I make this more readable? How do I make it more efficient? Is this the best way to do this? Is there a way I can make this more clear? Um, and that's all that uh, dry code um, really means. And then this is just, because this is such a rich topic, I'm really just kind of talking about the concepts here. And um, it, there's just so many more, like I haven't really gone into even like the tools or the skills um, that can help you do this um, because I don't wanna like get into things that we, we aren't at yet, but I do wanna give you a lot of resources to help you with this. So um, these are some really good resources. Um, obviously like I'm plugging my own course that I wrote too. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yeah, so like after you have some analyses and some projects and you have the question of like, how do I make this more reproducible? I think that's where, um, some of these things can come in handy. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's about all I got there. Um, are there any questions? I just wanted to say that this is why I mean, it might seem a little bit startling that we're talking about how you can make these um, analyses that you're going to re be creating reproducible, but we really wanted to give you a sense of this as you're starting, because the fact that you now know that our markdown exists and that you can make these reports is going to save you a lot of hassle. Um, so you can actually start making your, co your code more repeatable now that you know about these reports and that you know how to um, clear your, your workspace and environment and you know recreate your data objects. Um, so uh, this is giving you a leg up for later if you're starting thinking in report types of uh, ways of doing analyses.
I can actually, let me just show you rather than tell you. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of live coding here. So, you know, let's see. Um, so here's here's our studio, right? Here's what a, a script file. So to make a script file, I just go to our script. Um, now our scripts are good for some stuff, um, but not necessarily interactive development. So I can show you, uh, so like the same code, let's say I put summary cars and I put plot pressure, All right? So this, now these two scripts, let's see, I could save those. Um, they have the same code. They're gonna run the same code as this, this uh, example RMD as well. Um, but the difference is I could put this notation in here, but it's not as interactive and it's not as nice to report. So like, watch this, as I can run this stuff interactively, I can write my notes in this markdown language that makes a nice HTML report. I can run this, it prints out um, the results right here and keeps them for me to save. Whereas this, I can run it, but it doesn't actually save it in the document. It prints it out here, which doesn't save it to the same file. So if I send an R script to my collaborator, I'm basically forcing them to rerun it themselves before they can see the results. Whereas if I send them this, not only can they see my notes in between each code chunk to say like, I'm doing this for this reason. I'm, you know, uh, editing this, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and then I have my code and they can see it all in one spot. Um, the R script can still run R. It's just like, it's not as nice of like a, it's, it's not in like a report nice format. Can you show us again what those reports look like? Yeah, for sure. So then, yeah, so then I can admit it, right? And so like, look at, this is so nice. It even has my blah, uh, whatever I just wrote there um, versus the R script, which would like, I'd have to send them more than one file and they would have like no idea. So, and then the other thing I should show when, cause I talked about it is I should also put session info at the end of this. So that way people know when I ran this notebook, what I was using. So watch, I can put play. And this is showing you uh, my R, like this is what my computer is that I'm running. This is some packages that I have. These are attached packages that I'm using currently. Um, and so if I knit this now, now not only does my collaborator have my results and the steps that I took to get there, as well as some very intellectual thoughts I wrote down, um, but they also have all the information about what packages I used to get those results. So if there's any discrepancy between when they run this notebook again and when I wrote it again, um, we have some clues that we can go back and say, oh, look, you used, uh, you had our version 4.0 and I had 4.12, or like you had these packages attached and I had those, and it can really give you some uh, sleuthing that you can, trace back any problems. Uh, I also wanted to make a comment about uh, the learning process that a lot of you are currently in the middle of. Uh, it's also nice to have these reports because you can write really detailed notes if you're a note taker and describe to yourself, okay, we were in this lab and we did this and we had these packages open and this is how this worked. Um, and so it provides a much better opportunity for taking notes than writing a script would. So that's another reason to start using it as early as possible.